Folks, that's the song Storyville, performed and written by my friend Alain Maytel, way out in L.A., Hollywood, California. Folks, it's 10 o'clock on Wednesday, because if you hear the music Storyville, you know it's time for Storyville. I'm your host, Chuck Fink, and I just want to let you know that you're listening to WPVM LP in Asheville, North Carolina, 1037 on your dial, and globally at WPVMFM.org. Folks, I am so pleased to bring to you a very special and different kind of guest. Lee Lyons is not a professional storyteller. She took it up later in life to learn something new, and this is important, to have fun. Lee grew up in Anderson, South Carolina, and now is aging in place in Highlands, North Carolina. Uh, by the way, Lee and I are the same age, so wherever we go, folks, we're aging in place. Anyway, Lee uh, from Highlands now participates, or at least before COVID, she participated in the Highland Cashiers Players and the Highlands Writers Group. Lee is a member of the Asheville Storytelling Circle, yay, and the North Carolina Storytelling Network. In 2019, Lee published a book, Southern Shamrock, which you can find on Amazon. And Lee has her website, leelyons.me. Let me repeat that. That's leelyons.me. So folks, I asked Lee to come aboard so that others can learn and be inspired to become storytellers. Just as a hobby, you don't have to be a pro, you don't have to be a semi-pro. It's just fun to learn this. So Lee, Thank you for coming aboard and for inspiring so many other folks. Thank you. It's, it's fun to be here. My first radio interview. Well, hopefully it won't be your last. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lee, uh, let's just get started. I, I want to ask this question a little bit differently than I ask everyone else. Um, what do most people want to know about you? Well, Chuck, the main thing people always ask me as soon as they hear me talk, they say, where are you from? Texas? And of course, I tell them I'm from the South. I'm so Southern. I have a brother named Bubba. You know, <laughs> that's definitely Southern. But um, I have to say that I think an accent can sometimes work well with storytelling. And even though uh, I, people, I get a lot of comments sometimes about the Southern accent, I've met a lot of people uh, that way. Go to New York and you'd just be surprised how many people start talking to you. So um, it's a plus as it turns out. Yeah, I'm imagining you in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the folks could learn an awful lot from Lee Lyons from the South. So Lee, uh, we, a lot of us have learned about stories when we were kids, folks would tell us stories. Uh, did you hear a lot of stories at home or at school? Well, I truthfully wish I could say that I remembered stories in school, but um, I really don't. Uh, but I had a babysitter named Aggie and Aggie could not read or write. Uh, so she always told her stories. And I would say that um, she's the first storyteller I ever heard. And uh, she, she would make them up, of course. And some uh, one, my favorite was uh, called Proserpina. And I thought, where in the world did that story come from? When I got older and told that to my son, I started researching and found um, Persephone's in Greek mythology. And it has a lot of similarities. I don't know how Aggie heard that story, but uh, that is one I definitely um, remember and have written um, for my nieces and nephews. So they'll always have that. Uh, but my family really gave me a lot of fodder because um, they married young, had three children, divorced each other and got married again and had three more children. And I'm from that first batch, but um, <laughs> both of them have Irish ancestors. Um, my dad's family came from the um, south of Ireland and fought for the union. And my uh, parents, uh, my mother's family came from the north of Ireland and fought for the 
South in the Civil War. So uh, they, those families happened to meet in the Piedmont of South Carolina uh, right after the Civil War in the textile boom and the Union soldier went to work for the Confederate soldier. And so I think my parents were destined to meet. <laughs> You know, the other thing I, I think that your first story tells about your babysitter is sometimes we measure intelligence by book learning, by degrees, by things like that. And I've learned so much over the years, you do not measure intelligence that way. You don't have to be literate and necessarily to be intelligent. You aren't educated formally, but you still can be intelligent. So I'm so glad you brought that up. Thank you. So you went from the Piedmont area in the South and a visit to New York. And what brought you to the mountains of our wonderful Western North Carolina? Well, Chuck, I've been coming to Highlands since for 71 years with my grandparents. So I have roots here. Lee, excuse me, uh, I have to interrupt you. 71 years, you don't look a day over 50. <laughs> I think we're the same age. So <laughs> I, flattery will get you everywhere, you know. <laughs> But back then in the 50s, Highlands was the place where most people came to escape the heat. Uh, but now it's gotten real upscale with um, art, and music, and um, lots of good shops and restaurants. I mean, I hate for people to know how great it is. But what I love about it is it's um, no Home Depot, no Walmarts, just a you can walk from the post office to the pharmacy. And the main thing I really love about Highlands was totally unexpected, but because Highlands is small enough uh, that I've been able to try things that I have absolutely never done before, like join a writing group or be in a play, because sometimes they need a older Southern woman, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And they couldn't find one, so they asked you to play the role. <laughs> so uh, you said you were in plays. What's the best part you've had in a play? Well, my favorite play that I was in was the, is the Dixie Swim Club. And that was in Asheville at their uh, little theater uh, several years ago. And I played this, uh, the women, four women are lifelong friends, they get old over time. They end up about the age I am now. And my character, Bernadette, is getting Alzheimer's and um, she's getting a little fuzzy, but she asks her friends, have I had a nice life? And I just love that line because I wanna answer yes to that question in my own life. Oh. Well, you were in a play and you're also a storyteller and a writer. Do you have a story that you could share with us now, maybe about that aging um, <laughs> aspect of our lives? Well, I do think as we get older, we've got to keep a sense of humor. You know, during COVID, I was alone a lot and had a lot of times to think of, about all kinds of things. I started thinking about you know, first and last times. And it's kind of sad because I thought more about last times, like I'm on my last dog. You can see him on the sofa. <laughs> thought about my, you know, first car, a faded red Volkswagen. And in my last car, I, it's a Dodge Caravan with a big dent in the back because I forgot to look in the backup camera. And then I started thinking about my first and last kiss. And, you know, I cannot even remember the first one. I mean, if there's anybody out there listening and it was you, how about give me a clue? But my last kiss, <laughs> well, that's one I'll never forget. And it wasn't that long ago, but this man looked at me like I was the most beautiful woman in this world. Mm -hmm. And then he whispered in my ear, softly, yet clearly, oh, Libby. I asked, who the heck is Libby? My name is Lee. 
Now, you know, those kind of things happen as you get older. But I thought, next time I'm going to wear my Methodist church name tag. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I started thinking about my first and last pap smear. Now, I had my first pap smear when I was about 20 years old. I was petrified. This nurse put my feet in the stirrups, wrapped this sheet around me, knocked my knees apart and said, relax. While Dr. Johnson felt around down there. And I heard his voice between my legs ask, hey, how about that Georgia Clemson game? Ouch, I said, because that hurt. He lifted his head and said, I felt the same way when Clemson missed that field goal. <laughs> but I endured that painful process every year because women have to worry about their state of the union. <laughs> well, first you worry you'll get pregnant when you don't want to. Then you worry you can't get pregnant. Eventually it's men owe paws <laughs> and cancer. Why is it that the part of us that brings the most joy can bring the most trouble? Well, right before COVID, I went for that dreaded exam. And I noticed as the doctor felt my chest, he seemed in a hurry. I said, well, what's the matter, doc? You gonna be late for a tea time? He said, no, but after 40 years of practice, I'm retiring and you are my last patient and headed for the door. I said, well, now, hold on. What about, you know, the pap smear? He looked at me. He looked at my records. He said, you know, you're 70 years old. You've had a complete hysterectomy. You're no longer a... Uh, why don't you worry about something else like global warming? I said, wait just a minute. Is this about Medicare not wanting to pay? Are you trying to push granny over the cliff? He said, no. You just don't need one. I stumbled out of his office remembering the first time when I felt like I'd gone from a girl to a woman. And now I felt like I'd gone from a woman to, well, I don't know what. I remembered the first time when I couldn't wait to hop in bed with my boyfriend and now, well, I can't wait to hop in bed with my dog. <laughs> it should have been good news, right? But it was the bigger meaning. It meant that a part of me that was made for love and romance, well, that's over. And I hate to admit it, but that hurt worse than a pap smear. Thank you. Oh, Lee, by the way, that is such a funny story and you tell it so well, I have to say, you may say you're doing this as a hobbyist, but you're as good as so many other people I've had on the show. And if that doesn't inspire and encourage other people, then you're listening to the wrong radio program. <laughs> Lee, that was fantastic. Well, I hope it inspires them to get a regular pap smear too. <laughs> well, I don't know about our male listeners, but hopefully they will help some of the younger women that are younger than us. <laughs> So you also have, uh, I mentioned in, in your introduction that you published a book uh, a couple of years ago, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago. Uh, tell us about the book. Well, it took me 10 years to finish it. Um, it was on my bucket list. It is called Southern Shamrock. I took threads of my life and my family's Irish ancestry and then weaved a story about Margaret Ryan, who is looking to find a passion for life after the death of her son. And she goes to Ireland to look up her family tree, but the magic of Ireland has other ideas. And there's a bit of uh, romance 
and a wee bit of mystery. And I hope it'll make you want to forgive your grudges and uh, maybe go to Ireland if you've never been. It's my favorite place to visit. Well, first of all, I know you're Irish because you said a wee bit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just as an aside, my wife is really one quarter Irish, but to her, she's completely Irish. She's from oh. Massachusetts, and we went to Ireland. Uh, we stayed in Adair, at a wonderful little place called Adair Manor, and it's in the south of Ireland. And uh, it, it was just a lovely visit. And you're so right. If people are able to, you just have to put Ireland on your bucket list. And as a golfer, it's not a bad place either. There are a lot of golf courses in Ireland. <laughs> it is. Um, I, I won't say I actually played, but I tried to play Bally Bunyan, which is one of the best. And, um, and I've been to a dare with all those thatch roots, and that's a beautiful spot. Yeah. You know you're in Ireland when you go to a pub and you're, there's maybe mostly Irish and just maybe four or five Americans and one of the Americans say, Danny boy. And the Irish <laughs> folks break into it. And it is so beautiful. Oh, really? I'm thinking they must be so tired of having Yankee tourists ask all the time, could you play Danny boy? But they sure didn't show it. They sure were inspired. So how do you, I want to get back to you and <laughs> take a little side tour from uh, Ireland here. You get, in order to be a better writer, a better storyteller, what do you do to get better? How do you improve your skills? Well, Chuck, I, I found out about storytelling. I never heard of it uh, till I moved to Highlands. And as I've never been to a writing group, I ever thought about writing a book. Uh, but uh, in the writing group in Highlands, this lady named Nancy Reader, uh, it was in that group. And we organized monthly readings at our local watering hole, which is the Ugly Dog Pub, for about a year. And uh, we got a small group of followers that would come listen to us read. But I noticed that Nancy, uh, who has a master's in storytelling and uh, is involved in that a lot, she would always tell her stories. And I thought, gosh, that is so much more interesting uh, to the audience, especially. And so eventually I started uh, leaving my notes behind. And then through her, I found out about uh, the Asheville Storytelling Group and this group that I've been uh, Zooming with all during COVID. They've just been real lifesavers. The um, Georgia Mountain Tellers are the North Georgia Mountain Tellers there in Hayesville, North Carolina. So that's, that's how I got into it um, through the writing group. I would write essays that I never thought I would tell and I have tweaked a lot of them uh, and turned them into stories. Hmm. So how do you do that? Uh, how do you take the written word? Because as a storyteller and I teach classes on storytelling, so many people wanna write their stories first. And I always tell them, just say it out loud, get used to it. And then after you feel like it's part of you, then you start writing. Sounds like you do it differently. Tell us about that. Well, the reason I started out doing it different was because I wasn't in a storytelling group. I was in a writing group. And, but then I figured out a way to make a, the beginning, middle, and an end and uh, create a problem and they were more essays, but I did turn them into stories and I probably got about 10 that I've um, done that with. But now, like the one I did during COVID with the pap smear, I'm doing as you suggested. I just uh, tell it. Um, and I think that's probably the best way to do it. Just tell it, tell it, tell it. Well, uh, that's so helpful because not just me, but I'm sure every storyteller during COVID has developed a litany of new stories. And uh, the one I'm working on now, for instance, is about, and I'm from Cincinnati, don't hold that against me. <laughs> but uh, hey, we're on the Mason-Dixon line. <laughs> but uh, the one I, I'm working on is about being a sports fan in Cincinnati and how hard that is, especially if you're a football fan. But I did the same thing. I just started thinking and then spewing it out. 
And uh, then I realized there's a hole here, there's a hole there. Maybe I could punch that out. Maybe I could do a little less of this and a little more of that. And that's, that's the process. At least that is for me. And it sounds like you do that as well as writing the written word and converting it. Well, I do a little of both. And um, one of the hardest things for me is not to memorize. Uh, and it's different than being in a play with that third wall, but um, looking at people in the eye and up close and personal uh, can make me just go blank. Um, I've done it before, it's real scary, but you have to just start doing it and practice and then realize the world won't come to an end if you do go blank. Yeah, I'm also glad you mentioned that because so many new tellers think they have to memorize. And if they miss a word, it's terrible. And I always tell them, just like you said, you're not reading someone else's words. You're not speaking someone else's words. These are your own. If you miss something, you're the only one that knows you miss it. And if it's one of your darlings, which is what I call the favorite part of someone's story, <laughs> the funniest part, it's okay if you lose a darling. Don't worry about it. You'll fetch it, pick it up next time. And it's so hard for people to realize it's part of you. It's not, it's not a head game. It's a heart game. And it's, it's from your soul and your spirit. It doesn't have to be memorized. So thank you for underscoring that. <laughs> so uh, I guess you also have taken a few workshops here and there. Can you tell us about some of your workshops, your favorite workshop? Well, that is the one thing I've done. I, now, I've done lots of things, Chuck, to uh, improve and I want to say that I set a real low bar for myself. I just said I want to be able to tell a good story at a party. And um, I did that. And um, eventually, uh, I thought, you know, I guess if I just would put something on my bucket list, it would be to tell it, tell a bration. And with the Asheville Storytelling Group, and I was so thrilled to get to tell there. Um, so I have um, improved, I guess, going to workshops. Now, um, I like the workshops uh, because if I'm at home and I'm working on a story, I can get distracted and start cleaning out my closet or something like that. But if you're in a workshop, that's the only thing you're focused on. And um, my favorite workshop, two of them are with Connie Reagan Blake and with uh, Donald Davis. Mm. And the things I like about uh, those two are that they, there's a performance at the end. Now, having a performance at the end of a workshop is important to me because, you know, <laughs> If you're not a big name, how are you going to get people to come? And so they are big name draws and people will come here. Their students uh, do their little graduating uh, stories. And so, so I've really enjoyed uh, working with that and in a workshop that lasts more than an afternoon or a couple of hours. Now I've taken a lot of those too and enjoy it. But the thing that helps me the most, if I just get into a situation for several days or uh, even a week, Donald Davis is last a week. And uh, I've been to his at Okra Coke and I'm going to his in July in uh, LaGrange, Georgia. Uh, so Connie Reagan helped me a lot with the one I did at Telebration. And I do think that's my best story. It's about... Um, wearing a Spanx to my 50th high school reunion. And I can't do that on radio, but um, she did help me uh, with one that I did um, in one of her workshops. Oh, but by the way, for the folks who may not be aware, Lee just mentioned two huge names in the world of storytelling. Donald Davis is considered by many, by most, to be the number one teller in the world. And he's from around these year parts. Um, he's He's from Waynesville, which is about 30 miles uh, west of Asheville. And then Connie Reagan Blake is an absolute gem to the world of storytelling and to the world beyond storytelling. She, uh, she's an icon. And uh, so if you learn from both Connie and uh, Donald Davis, you're learning from the best, my friend. 
So uh, have you had any other workshops besides those two? Well, I, I wanted to tell you one that I had worked on with Connie Reagan Blake, if you've got time for that one. Sure. Um, uh, this was one that she has a, a performance in Black Mountain uh, after a three day workshop. And I have titled it Sleeping Indian, even though some people say you shouldn't have a title. It was the first summer after my divorce. And my eight year old son ran out the door into the arms of his dad and new stepmom for their two week vacation. Suddenly I had all this time. So I went to the movies, having no idea what was playing. The movie was City Slickers about three men going off to a dude ranch. I ate my popcorn and thought, wow, I'd like to have a life changing adventure like that. Do you believe in fate? When I got home in my mailbox, there was a catalog on Western adventures. Three days later, I landed in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I think I got the last space and the word dude was not in the description. I packed my allotted 10 pounds, my sleeping bag, uh, down jacket, and okay, I'll admit it, my lipstick and new underwear. Plus, I bought a black cowboy hat at the airport. I mean, what the heck? I was going out west. I met the other campers and we saddled up right in the town of Jackson Hole. There were three couples from Kentucky who were lifelong friends hoping for a big adventure. And a newly married couple from California with their respective teenage daughters hoping for a bonding experience. We headed out single file up a dirt road with the view of Sleeping Indian Mountain in the distance. Sleeping Indian Mountain looked just like its name, over 10,000 feet elevation, like a Native American in full headdress laying horizontal leathered face to the sun. Well, I rode along with one of the guides, George, Oh, scuffed up boots, beat up old hat. But out there, that man was a genius. He knew all about the flowers and wildlife and I expect he knew a lot about people too. Because that Kentucky crowd, they got horses with names like Bucky and Lightning. But thankfully, I got a sweet little sorrel mare named Muffin. And we forged streams that I filled with laughter and trotted through fields of wildflowers and stopped at the edge of a lake that was so smooth it reflected sleeping Indian mountain like a mirror. A big old trout jumped up in the middle, sending ripples out in all directions. And like some kind of cowboy guru, George said, yep, you never know where the ripples in your pond will end up. Wow, I needed a lemon to keep from smiling. I was living the movie. But eight hours later, when we got to camp, my butt was burning and my head was pounding. As the steak sizzle and smoke filled the air, I eased into my tent and threw up in my new cowboy hat. <laughs> I heard Georgia, oh, ma'am, are you all right? Hell no, heck no, I'm not all right. I think I've got that flu that kills you in 24 hours. He gave me some Dramamine and said, sleep it off till morning. All night, I huddled in my sleeping bag wondering, why hadn't I gone to a spa? I could be getting a massage right now. 
And what would my son think if I died on a trail ride? Well, the next morning, I awakened to the smell of coffee and bacon and I was starving. I grabbed my toothbrush, ran down to the creek in my long underwear, took hold of a branch, crack. I fell into the coldest water I've ever felt. Help! Well, old George to the rescue. Well, that episode sort of broke the ice with everybody and we all warmed up with each other, which was a good thing because I needed some dry clothes. And after that, strange things started happening. Well, for one, it started snowing in July. And later, as we swapped stories around the fire, sipping Kentucky bourbon, newly single in that altitude, <laughs> old George started looking pretty good. Well, the last night we all met at the Silver Dollar Bar to say our goodbyes. George sauntered in, looking completely different. Nice shaped hat, exotic skin boots, a big silver buckle, one in a rodeo. He locked those sky blue eyes into mine and those firm hands pulled me on the dance floor. We two stepped around the room and <sighs> Let me just put it this way. He was quite a dancer. <laughs> the last thing he said to me was, if you ever need a rescuing, you know where I'll be. But I got back to my home on the coast of South Carolina and I couldn't picture a cowboy out on the beach. And then my son came running back into my arms and well, I knew that the dream of it would be better than the reality. Mm -hmm. That first solo adventure was over 30 years ago and it truly was life changing. You know, I always thought I'd go back, but I went other places instead. But sometimes when I'm sleeping, I smell sweat mixed with horse's hair. And I still dream of that Indian, face like leather, riding up the dirt road, light as a feather. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Lee, you are a tremendous teller. Uh, oh, Chuck, you're going to make me have to, I keep a low bar. <laughs> well, your low bar, if you compare that to the worldwide bar, you need to set your bar a lot higher because you are just, you're, you're a very inspiring teller. You, your timing is great. Your word selection is great. You're, you're, even with it's just you and me, you can see how you're trying to make a connection with your audience. And that is so important for a teller to be able to do. My friend, you have the talent and the skills of someone more than just a hobbyist. So I'm, I'm here to encourage you, actually. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, what I love um, about that story is I say that's when I worked on uh, with Connie Reagan. Uh, my favorite stories uh, have, uh, use humor, but have some poignancy about them. And um, as I said, Donald Davis was one of my other favorites, uh, workshops, and he would always say, there's the story you're telling, and then there's the real story you're telling. And that always resonated with me because um, sometimes you tell a story and then you realize um, that it has more meaning and you really want to get at the heart of the story. And you have done that tremendously so far with both of your stories. And I, that's the thing, if you can connect yourself with other people in the honest way that you have, to me, that is a priceless gift that you're sharing with people. So keep up the good work. Now, I also wanna mention that uh, you were inspired by the movie, uh, City Slickers. Right, City Slickers. So your movie would be, the title would be changed to Beach Slickers. <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> and your story also reminded me, uh, I won't go into the actual story I tell, this is just a very brief description, but during COVID was my 70th birthday and also our 40th anniversary. So where are we going to celebrate our 40th? Uh, the plans for the birthday just went asunder. By the way, you learned during COVID, none of that stuff matters. They're just numbers on a calendar. Right. Uh, but we decided to celebrate a, like an Airbnb in our anniversary in Tate City, Georgia. Tate City, Georgia has a population, if you look on Wikipedia, of zero. <laughs> on the town sign, it says like 37, but there literally are no people there. And we went horseback riding at a, at a ranch. And my horse, I think, was like your, uh, uh, <laughs> was Bubba. And I was the- Southern, only, a Southern horse. A Southern horse. <laughs> and I was the only man. And it's a creek ride. You have to ride through the creek. Well, Bubba was not that thrilled to have the only man on his back, I think, because he took me into the brush and the bushes and almost knocked me into the creek. So, yeah. Um, I'm a city slicker, what can I say? Cincinnati is a city and I live now in a small town, Weaverville, but that city part of me is still there. I love your stories. You're so enriching. And you, when you tell a story, you're enriching the lives of the listener just by listening to you tell your stories. That is just so inspiring. Now, you mentioned two workshops, uh, Donald Davis and Connie Reagan Blake. Have you had any other workshop experiences? Well, one of my other uh, favorite workshops is from Tom Chalmers. Now he's from Asheville and does a lot of work with 30 Below, which is, you know, at the bottom of the um, Asheville Theater. And he teaches a class that uh, I found out through the Flat Iron Writers Group. Um, like I said, writing le has led me to storytelling. And he does the moth format of trying to keep it five minutes and true story. And he it's a six week class. Now, the only bad part is for me, two hours uh, driving to Asheville and then two hours back. But I enjoy, I've enjoyed taking his uh, six week courses about three times. He's like, what are you going to take again? <laughs> but I, I am totally convinced he can make any story better uh, and cut it down to size. I think that's one of the hardest things for, um, at least it was for me to think everything you have to say uh, is so important and that you could leave this out or start in a different place. And um, I, I do think that it's always good to, for whatever story you're doing to have a short version, you know, for time's sake and audience and whatnot. So, that I really enjoyed his because he really makes you keep a story to five minutes. And I, I can tell you one if you <laughs> want to hear one more. Oh, give it to us by all means. I, before you tell it, I just want to let okay. you know that I have not taken Tom Chalmers class, but I have performed, I think it's 35 below at the Asheville Community. Oh, 30, okay. And I've done that a few times and it's fun. And Tom makes it so much fun. And also a little bit about Tom. I believe he uh, lived in LA where he was a performer and he also did improv. So uh, whenever I see Tom, I think of my son who's uh, struggling out in LA now in, in the world of acting and in the world of performing. But uh, Tom came here instead of staying in LA and I think has done not only good work for himself but for the Asheville community. So that's my plug for Tom. Now well, it's and if anybody can take that and his has a performance at the end too, which as I've said, if you're a beginner, uh, just being able to tell in front of live audiences and sometimes you can get video too. And that's the best teacher in the world to actually, you'd kind of go die when you see yourself, but it's still the best learning experience to, um, and Connie Reagan does that in hers too. So, but, um, but this is one now, he does not um, try to be sweet and kind and not hurt your feelings and, and not that he's rude in any way, but you're there to get that story cut down. And he, some people that give workshops 
are too afraid they'll hurt your feelings. I think if they give you some serious critiquing, um, but critiquing is telling the good and the bad, not just uh, the bad, but, but he doesn't, he doesn't waste any time. So, but uh, this is one I wrote um, a family story and a healing story uh, about hiking on the Appalachian Trail. And of course I went through every mile and it, it just was so boring. So he got it down to size. Okay. I asked my nephew, Andrew, what do you want for college graduation? I figured he'd ask for money, but he got this far away look in his eyes and said, I wish I could hike on the Appalachian Trail with my family. Well, true, he had been an Eagle Scout and likes to camp, but with my family? Now that was a problem because Andrew's father died when he was 12 and his mother, my younger sister, had just had a mastectomy. <laughs> so she couldn't go. Well, that just left his aunt and uncle, my brother and sister. And that was a problem for me because the last person in the world I wanted to hike with was my older sister, the executor of daddy's estate. Now, when our dad died, my sister and I had a come apart. Oh, that is much worse than a falling out. We grew up sleeping in the same bed and now we hadn't said one word in five years. And truthfully, we were always complete opposites. I mean, she made straight A's. I'm not gonna tell you what I made. She dated the good, smart guys. I dated the bad boys. She has a PhD. I have hmm, life experiences. Mm. No, I did not want to hike with her. I looked at Andrew just fixing to say no when I thought, Andrew's lost his dad and his mother has cancer. And on top of that, I lost my son in a car accident when he was just about Andrew's age. How many times had I said, I wish. So I said the only thing I could, let's go. Now we sent out all kinds of emails inviting people to join us, got all kinds of excuses. Now my favorite was from Episcopal priest who said, while Jesus walked in the wilderness for 40 days, he never hiked with the Lions family, so he passed. But we got five takers. Now, the big surprise was my aunt, who won't let me tell her age, but she said, oh, darling, that's always been on my bucket list. And then my brother and sister-in-law in Wisconsin said, we'll be there. Then the dreaded older sixth sister texted, count me in. So we had six weeks to get in shape, except my sister who already wears a size six and jogs four miles a day. But I maxed out my credit card and walked around town in a full backpack. And every day we sent out emails to each other on the best hiking shoes, the best camping equipment, what to do in case of a bear attack, a bee sting, a snake bite. I call that hiking foreplay. <laughs> but finally, the morning arrived 
when we took our first steps on the AT at Springer Mountain, Georgia. My backpack was the lightest at 25 pounds. We averaged about a mile an hour to the Hawk uh, Mountain Shelter just before dark with enough time to pitch our tents and repurify our water. Now, before we started out, uh, we envisioned cooking a big dinner by the fire and sharing stories. Forget it. We just fell into our tents and ate trail mix and tried to sleep. <laughs> But that wasn't easy. I have to tell you, that trail mix makes for a lot of flatulence. Well, the next morning, when we finally got geared up and into a standing position, it was obvious my aunt and my sister-in-law were throwing in the towel. And my chivalrous brother volunteered to escort the ladies out. Well, that just left my nephew and my sister, who I still hadn't spoken to. Well, Andrew thought we ought to give up some of our equipment to send out with them. I knew what that meant. I was going to have to sleep in the same tent with her. But the three of us forged on another 10 miles straight up, kicked your you-know-what mountain in the pouring rain and got to camp as the sun was setting. And I'm gonna tell you something, I never saw a bear, I never saw a bee, I never saw a snake. I only saw one thing that scared the heck out of me. The latrines, <laughs> you don't want to go there. Well, my sister and I slept back to back. And <laughs> We stunk inside and out. But somehow I managed to sleep on that wet, rocky red Georgia clay. And the next morning I smelled coffee. I thought, Lord, I've died and gone to heaven. Well, I unzipped my tent and maybe they were real live trail angels, but they were two men making gourmet coffee out on the trail. Well, one of them was a barista from Oregon. He gave my sister and I a cup and well, she sipped on her rock and I sipped on mine. <laughs> I don't know what they put in that stuff, but I started giggling on my rock and she started giggling on hers. I started laughing we both started laughing. We started laughing like fools. We started laughing like sisters. Andrew got the pictures to prove it. I think he planned it the whole time. Now I've heard there's magic out on the trail and I think we found it because Andrew got his wish and I well, I got my sister back. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Lee, that is a lovely, lovely story. Uh, how about you and your sister now? Oh, great. We're, we're still hiking together. And my younger sister is um, cancer free. Uh, so, we're blessed because five years is a long time not to speak. A lot can happen. And uh, we got to get back together. We'll all be together on the 4th of July. So I'm really looking forward to that. Well, hopefully you'll see the fireworks in the sky and the fireworks in the family will be way down. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you sometimes know. that doesn't work out in our family, but uh, we're kind of getting older. So we're getting a lot more low key. And if I can, just for our audience's sake, if you're not familiar with the Appalachian Trail, the AT, it is a long trail. It's like more than a thousand miles, starting in Georgia and ending in a mountain peak in Maine. And some people hike the whole trail, some people do segments of it, but uh, it's, it's an arduous hike. You're hiking through the Appalachian Mountains the entire way. 
And uh, the other thing about, <laughs> I think you touched on it in your story <laughs> as well, is something called trail magic. And I found that out from a friend who was a trail magician. And uh -huh. that's people who would create food and go to various uh, camping sites and distribute the food to, to hikers because the hikers needed that trail magic. So again, you brought the magic out as well. There's one other part of your story that just hits so hard for me. It wasn't the AT, it was the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. But uh, my son, my older son who's now 37, was 12. And uh, he and I and another father and son hiked the Boundary Waters. I shouldn't say hike, we paddled the Boundary Waters. And they're the Boundary Waters because they're on the border of Canada and uh, Minnesota. And the state bird in Minnesota, by the way, is mosquitoes. <laughs> so it was tough, but uh, there are also a lot of bears in there. So you had to hoist up your food 30 feet over a tree line so that the bears couldn't get to it. <laughs> and then the last night we saw a storm coming in and we weren't able to find a place to camp except this rock island. And the storm was coming in quickly. So we went there, we set up camp, we found out the next day a tornado had touched down about a half a mile from where we were camping. <laughs> so as, as you say, it's all about the adventure. And as we live, if you're not taking advantage of the adventures that are offered to you, you're not living. <laughs> so we, I, this, these are just great. And I, as I, and when I introduced you, I mentioned that you are also here to inspire other people to learn to tell stories. And if you don't even learn formally, just start telling stories. So uh, do you have any suggestions for those rookies on how to get started? Well, I think number one is start listening to storytellers. And of course with COVID, there are all kinds of opportunities online now. Uh, I'm, I much prefer uh, person to person but I have heard different storytellers just because I could zoom in with them. I took one of those great courses. Uh, they have those on storytelling, read lots of books. And um, just, as I say, started really in the writing group telling at the Ugly Dog Pub. But that gives you, a, just doing that with people really helps out and find a dog or a few good friends that will listen to you tell something over and over. Mine kind of roll my eyes and say, oh my God, she's gonna tell us a story. But I, I think that's one of the things that you have to do. And I do highly recommend these workshops uh, if you can get away and do that because you just get immersed in, in storytelling. But Chuck, some people play bridge and they work those little puzzles. Uh, but for people getting older, um, it keeps your mind active, kind of trying to concoct a new story and practicing it, and, um, meeting a lot of new people. I mean, there's so many diverse people in storytelling that it just always blows my mind, all the different um, walks of life people have been on. So I think that um, anybody can do it. We've all got a stories and maybe you just want to pass those down to your family. I mean, family stories are so important. And um, my AT story, I hope that um, the next generation will be telling that story and they might get inspired to um, go on a hike on the AT too, you know? Oh, that is so sweet. Yeah, I, I think, um, like you say, I think the inspiration is all around us, the, the stories in our lives. And the older you get, the more stories you have. So uh, I think being able to share that and to learn that in any age, but especially at our age, and to tell personal stories. I have to mention, uh, you mentioned Connie Reagan Blake. And Connie Reagan Blake is a treasure to storytelling, to Appalachia. Uh, I, I just read where her work is now being put in the Library of Congress. Uh, uh, I'm, yeah, yeah, the Library of Congress. And she's also, uh, she's just, she has tapes, she has books, she has so much that she's contributed. But she just had a, a show on the International Storytelling Circles uh, Zoom that uh, was, uh, I think it was like Sunday or, no, it was, yeah, 
uh, Friday through Sunday. And I was fortunate enough to be able to listen to Connie Reagan Blake. And she can tell personal stories as well as tales, but she told the story of how she got into storytelling. And that too was so inspiring to hear from someone like Connie Reagan Blake, how she got started. And it's just like the rest of us. It just, there's some event that sparked it. So thank you so much for sharing that story. And I have a, another uh, question for you, and that's about the future. We talked about COVID. What do you see happening for yourself with stories in the next year or so? Well, in July, I'll be taking the Donald Davis workshop. That's going to be my first thing that is really getting back into um, telling in person. And I hope I'll just be going and hearing um, different storytellers. One thing that's on my bucket list uh, is starting a storytelling group in Highlands. It's, we have all this art and music and plays, but for some reason we don't have a storytelling group. Uh, and when you get older, it is hard driving at night to some of these, a, a lot of storytelling events and the moth storytelling events are at night. Uh, so I would love to have a storytelling group uh, here. And uh, I hope I'll still be going to Hayesville. Uh, I love that uh, Hayesville has a group they meet um, every Thursday and they critique, you can get feedback, which is a wonderful thing to have. And then they do a performance once a month. Uh, so I hope I can participate with, with them and the Asheville Storytelling Group in some way. But well, probably I'll just be telling stories to my family and friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lee, and if you keep on telling to your families and friends, you're shortcutting the rest of us. So please keep on telling on stages as well. This has been so much fun, Lee. I wanna thank you for taking this hour and for sharing all of your, your stories and your life with a smile and a laugh. That's so valuable. Thank you so much. And for the folks listening, this has been Lee Lyons on Storyville on WPVM LP in Asheville, North Carolina, 1037 on your dial and globally at WPVMFM.org. Lee, let's say goodbye to everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. I had a wonderful time.